Hi, uh, I'm Johan. I'm from Badlands. And today I'm going to talk about uh, LibTPA, which is actually another user space TCP site. And I'm also going to show the experience of developing like a user space TCP site, especially like from scratch. Uh, here is the uh, agenda, actually it's, it's quite long, right? Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about the background, something like why I need to, to describe, uh, to develop like a stack from from scratch, and then I'm going to talk about the design and the testing and the debugability, and then programming guide, user guide, and last, I'm going to show um, the performance. Uh, so uh, it's a quite a well known uh, issue, right? That Kernel TCP is really inefficient uh, due to overheads like the system calls, the interrupt, and also like even the VFS layer also has noticeable overheads. So, and with the emergence of DBDK, many DBDK based user space TCP stacks have been developed, such as MTCP, F stack, and TLTK, and so on. Well, Although there are so many of them, but they share a lot of like common issues. Um, specifically, we have like five issues. Like the first one is most of them break the Linux kernel networking stack. And actually, as far as I know, all the, it's, it's all the open source and TCP stacks break them. And they also only allow like one user space TCP stack with one nick only. Uh, the third is not enough, um, mostly due to lack of the zero copy support, and they have uh, limited test cases and limited uh, debug tools. And then I'm going to break down all these five issues and, and also some like possible solutions. Uh, the first and second issues are actually caused like, um, by the typical, typical usage, that is, um, it takes control of the need completely. And for that reason, there is no package would go to the kernel and then the kernel networking stack would be broken. And then you have no like the Linux ecosystem, you have no debug tools like TCP dump and other tools like if config and something else, right? And then there is like a, a well-known solution and that is to redirect all other traffic to Linux kernel through a virtual NIC, such something like uh, KNI, and that is also well known to DBDK community, right? And what I use and then type, just like this figure short, there is like a TCP stack, and it takes control of the NIC completely, uh, and then and there is a virtual NIC, and the two ports are also attached to the TCP stack, and then the TCP stack will do some like packet forwarding, and to forward some other package to the Linux kernel, and then the package will go directly to the like some native Linux APPs. And well, the solution works, but it has two major drawbacks. And the first one is the stack is a single point of failure. And when there is a crash, the networking service would be broken, just like I said. And even upgrade also will break the networking service for a while from like maybe a few seconds to like few minutes. That depends on your application upgrade time, right? And also it is clear that this component will easily become the bottleneck. And well, since all the packages are going, will go through the, the stack, so it will also impact the performance to other Linux applications. And to demonstrate that, I did a few tests. And there are actually a few testing setups. As you can see, the, uh, there are like two hosts. Uh, host one is uh, running a application called like TPOF. It, it's actually a like TPA benchmark, something I'm going to talk about later. And it, it always use TPA as a TCP backend and it will run like a latency test with uh, a Linux kernel TPO. So um, that is the baseline, I mean, uh, this connection here, you can see the baseline is something like uh, 15 um, microseconds. 
And then the second case is in this figure. Like, well, you can see that uh, the package actually will go through the F stack, right? And then it will go, uh, go through again to the Linux kernel and then to, to the TPO. And there are actually two cases here. The first case is like F stack is doing nothing. It's just like forwarding the package. And we, I call it a, uh, F stack like idle. And you can see that even though F stack is idle, and you can see that and the latency is double, is nearly double, right? And, and the third case is uh, uh, when the F stack is somehow overlaid, over, uh, overloaded, but it's not like 100% overloaded, overloaded. And you can see um, the, the uh, latency is like increased like greatly, right? To like, or even something like four million seconds. So you can see the performance impact. And also, uh, the third issue is uh, about the throughput, and that's basically because it do not support the zero copy. And to demonstrate that, I did a test like, with uh, one call, and and it's like, uh, the right size is eight kilobytes. And you can see that the base that we can get is something around uh, 35 uh, gigabits per second. And well, what's worse is that some, some stacks even have two copies for each I.O. direction. So that's not really good. Either. And the, the, the fourth and the, and the um, fifth issue is that about uh, testing and debugability. Um, well, just like we said, we have a lot of TCP uh, implementations, but they mainly just come up with a basic TCP implementation. I think that's, that's fun, right? That's what we really need. But however, TCP is a very complex system, and user space TCP stack, especially a stack from scratch, is somehow expected to be buggy. And then when something goes wrong, a lot of people will suspect that um, the, the, the TCP stack uh, would be uh, the problem. So for, for that kind of reason, we need, the first thing is we need to, we need to have like a solid testing so that we have a stable stack. And the second thing is that we need some like good uh, debugability to make our photo life easier when it's uh, on production, right? Um, something like, well, some people will find you and will teach you to to look, to um, fix some uh, to root cause some bug. And if it's, it's all bug with a good good tools, uh, we can easily uh, root cause the bug and then fix it. And if it's not a bug, we need to prove that and to show them well, it's not a bug and something like that. And now I'm going to talk about the design. So what, what is TPA uh, specifically? Um, put simply, it's just another TCP stack. It's open sourced and it's from scratch. And it's mainly to address all about five issues I just mentioned. And the first one is, well, it can code. It exists with the Linux kernel network stack. So it will not break other Linux applications. And it allows multiple user space TCP stack instance with one Nick only. So you can have like um, more, uh, one, more than one application got accepted. Right? And the third one is, it's kind of fast because it supports the copy read and write since the very beginning. And it has 200, more than 200 unit test cases and has dozens of debug and maintenance tools. The socket tracing I'm going to talk about later is also very helpful for, for debug purpose. And here is a overall architecture. And as you can see from like from the from the bottom, like there is one nick, there is one nick only. And we actually simplify the nick as a bunch of queues here. And you can see the queues are divided to different applications. Some queues are divided to uh, TPA application, and some other queues are divided to like Linux kernel stack. Um, with that help, we can actually implement the code existing. 
And uh, you can also see that, let's, let's zoom in the TPA application. You can see that, uh, well, there are like many uh, worker sways. And actually, um, those sways are not created by, by TPA. And TPA is an uh, embedded TCP stack. We do not create a uh, worker sways. We just use uh, the sways created by the application. And there is actually one suite created by TPA is a control suite. We do some like um, management routine here, like ARP and NDP, and some also there is a shell interface uh, to to access some commands and to dump some information, do some control and management stuff. And you can also see the Linux kernel stack is well maintained. It still access the NIC natively without without anything like a virtual NIC, right? So the performance would, would be really, really good. And, and so here's uh, the key to, to um, implement, to reach, to address the first and second issue, that is to coexist with Linux kernel and to run as many as um, user space stacks as possible. And, the so flow application is uh, a unique feature. It just likes to split the package between uh, user space and kernel space. The key here is to uh, install some rules to tell the NIC to, to tell the NIC like what kinds of package should go to the user space and what kinds of the package should go to the Linux kernel stack. And you can find the uh, DBDK documentation for further information and here is how uh, TPA use uh, flow application. Uh, we, as we can see here, we normally use uh, local port for uh, for stealing. And for active connections, uh, we use a queue action to steal packages to, to the current worker way so that we can share or we can implement the shared nothing architecture. And for the passive actions. Connections, we use RS action to distribute the package to all the worker switches. So no single worker switch will be the bottleneck. And we also use the mask merge to save the number of unique rules. Without that, we need to like uh, set one rule for each port. With that, we can set one port or one rule for a lot of ports. And below are two specific examples. The first one is about uh, active connection. You can see uh, the match is uh, three tuple. Uh, uh, the test IP and TCP port and the test port is a mask match, so it's a, it matches a range of ports. And the action is to direct all the matched packages to the second queue, and then it will, and then will be directed to a specific worker. And the third, the second example is a, a, a passive connection. It's a listening connection, like its application is listening on the port uh, 80. And the match is quite similar. Well, the, and the action then becomes RSS, and then the package will go, especially the same package will be distributed to different workers. Uh, and there is actually a key challenge to, 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 to steal packages based on the local TCP port. And that is we need to make sure uh, TP applications and the Linux applications do not use the same TCP port. Uh, assume like uh, there is a, a Linux application like SHD is already using the sec, uh, 20, uh, 22 port, right? The port number 22. And then we, we start a TP application, and we also want to listen on uh, the, the port like 22. And then when you, you create that, uh, TPA will install, a, will install a flow to steal package with a local port 22 to TPA, and then it will break the SH connections. Right? So that's really, really fatal. Uh, so to, to, to fix this, to um, tackle this challenge, there are like two possible solutions. The first one is really simple. Uh, we just divide the port between TPA and the Linux kernel through a, a standard interface, the proc file. Um, but it doesn't really work between two TPA, TPA applications. 
and it also doesn't work for uh, um, for servo applications for the listening port. Uh, and then I am going. I'm thinking. Well, maybe. Well, it looks like a straightforward solution would be we have a, a local centralized port allocation demo, right? Uh, every time you want to use a port, you just uh, um, um, request a port, and then it will, will, will return to you. But it's really well. The, the idea is really simple and straightforward, but it's actually it's, it's much harder to make it robust, uh, simply because both the demo and the TPA application may crash, and you may have to upgrade them, and the upgrade order may also matter. And when some uh, one like the demo process quits, you need to uh, reconnect and uh, to sync all the port statuses. That would make it really, really like complex and necessary. And and more importantly, it doesn't still doesn't work between TPA and the next kernel, because uh, uh, unless the unless you need to, unless you modify the kernel. And then I, I later uh, after a lot of actual thinking, um, I later came up with like uh, I think in my opinion a very neat and elegant solution, and that is by leveraging the an existing POSIX API that is a band API. And here's the curl snippet. And you can see that every time you, we want to allocate a port, we, we create a dummy socket. And then we bind the port to the dummy socket. If the band succeeds, it means no one using the port, so we can use it freely. And if some someone already take support and that band would fail and then we can continue to find another port. And uh, we, we do not play, we do not close the uh, dummy FD here and so we can keep the and we can we can occupy the port as far as application is alive. And the port will be reclaimed automatically by the Linux kernel when the application quits. So I think in my opinion that that's a really really like neat and so with the uh, ability to coexist with Linux kernel, uh, let's re revisit the performance impact. And here uh, I did another group of tests, you can see. And that is the third one. You can see that the, uh, the TPA application um, still talks with uh, uh, TPA Linux, Linux application. And there is a TPA, uh, TPA stack. And the TPA stack is, is busy. It has a lot of TCP connections. But since it doesn't really impact because it shares the NIC, and so you can see the, the latency is not really, really affected. You can see uh, it's basically the same. And in, uh, so a TPA can provide some kind of like performance isolation. So uh, now let's talk about zero copy. Uh, well, it's uh, well known that zero copy is really needed for for high throughput. But even though, um, as far as you know, there's still no like uh, user space TCP stack that supports zero copy. Uh, for for the zero copy right for the right uh, side, actually is quite straightforward. Uh, we just need to uh, allocate a header and buff. Right, header and buff, and we we, we fill the we, we set up the the networking header there, and then we we create some um, the right well we, I call it the right and buff here and attach to the payload from given from the user, and then we we train them and we have a complete packet and we can then send send it to the while, right, and then we have zero copyright. Uh, in in TPA, we we create three types of MBUF main pools. Um, the first two is uh, already shown here, and the third one is a generic MBUF that is for uh, other use cases such as like uh, receiving packets from the NIC. Uh, and since uh, since the introduction of uh, the right MBUF main pool, and it does only one thing that is attaching to external buffer. So we can, for that kind of reason, we can have like a slightly more lightweight solution. 
uh, just like show here. You can see, well, we just assign some key uh, fields to attach the uh, external buffer. And we don't have to, and for, for freeze, it's also much simpler. We don't have to, to freeze them uh, to, 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 to reset the, like to do the reset, to do, to, to do the uh, detach. Uh, because well, because uh, the mbuff is just only one purpose is for attaching the external memory. So every time we allocate it, we just used to uh, to detach to attach another one, and we will reset them correctly at that time. So we don't have to worry about um, uh, to to reset them. Uh, for for the read part, actually, is not that straightforward. Uh, the reason is majorly because uh, the read buffer is prepared by TPA or be specifically by DBDK instead of, instead of the application. Um, uh, um, for the receive side, uh, the packages are received from the NIC and then stored in the MBUF. And it will go through the TCP stack and with the network header decapped and then we pass the MBUF to the application and the application then can use it directly to achieve zero copy rate. And, and there is actually a, a key issue to, to resolve to implement zero copy and that is who and when to reclaim the right and the read buffer. And there is one, however the principle is, is somehow simple a, it's something like it's only the last user knows when and the original buffer owner knows how. For example, taking the right as an example, uh, we can only reclaim the buffer when it's completely activated by the remote end. And for sure, it's only TPA knows that, right? And since the buffer is from the application, is allocated from the application, so its, it's application knows how to f how to uh, freeze them. So to to change the two, well, for the zero copyright, and uh, TPA will notice the app uh, to reclaim the buffer when it is completely accurate, and that is quite similar to uh, the zero copy rate, and that is uh, is only the app application knows when the data has been processed. And when it's been processed, it needs to um, tell uh, the, TPA, the TPA to, to freeze them. And, and to implement um, zero copy, uh, we have to extend the IO and the standard IO vector uh, structure. And we added a few more uh, fields, especially uh, the first one is uh, a physical address. And that is um, quite obvious, needed for uh, the DMA. And we also added two uh, callbacks just to um, do the notification to let the uh, buffer owner to free um, the buffer when it's no longer needed. And the two API is quite similar to the post API. And just besides, uh, they use uh, the customized uh, IO with. Um, I will vector. And now I'm going to talk about the testing. And again, TCP is a very complex system. Uh, and what's worse, I just got one person and myself. And I just got like a few months budget. So the best thing I can think of to make sure to to make sure the stability is testing, but somehow I firstly I have no clue like what kind of testing system should be to to be able to address the challenge. Uh, but I'm, what I'm quite certain about is uh, we need to cover right all the possible as like, as many as possible cases as possible something uh, not only in the normal case and but also well especially about uh, abnormal cases so I did the first try I, I wrote, wrote something called uh, packet files 
how it basically um, do some like files uh, based on a given weight and something like uh, drop some package, like drop one or few packages uh, with like maybe 10% rate. And also something like cut a few bytes from the packet, maybe from the head, from the tail, or from both. Of course, with the sequence uh, uh, co collected. And also uh, du duplicate some packets, well, especially some um, control packets, like thin packets. I mean, if you talk with Linux kernel, and Linux kernel is a well functional TCP stack, it will always retain something normal. We will never return something abnormal, right? And then if you're only testing with the Linux kernel stack, you can never test something, right? You will never, never test something like abnormal, something like the, the duplicate thing package. So I lost something like that. And well, with one nick, I create two VF. Uh, and then uh, one VF is owned by a TPA stack, and another one is owned by the TCP kernel TCP stack. And then the packet files will connect to VF by the VF representative. And then I can have a uh, like testing theme where with like only one host, so I can do a lot of like scripting. That would be helpful, right? Um, and then I realize. It, it wouldn't work. It won't work well because it, it's really hard to enumerate all the abnormal cases. And what's worse is not efficient because um, it means to like to produce the bar, some bug like on a given rate. And so it may take hours or even days to trigger a bug and so the bug should be somehow hard to root cause, and that somehow depends on the produce, right, reproduce. So it may even take like longer to, to fix it. So that is really e inefficient, especially I just have few months. So I then realized that unit testing should be a really, really perfect solution because it can easy to enumerate all like autonomic cases as far as you can think of. Um, and then it should be very efficient. It may um, write a, you may write a, uh, take test cases with a few line code and you may also reproduce a bug in a few lines of code. Um, but somehow I, I was thinking something somehow a slightly different from a a standard unit testing, uh, and I then made a POC with a, a TCP three-way handshake process. I assume we want to connect with, to do the connection. Uh, firstly, the application will um, invoke the connect API, and then TPA will send out a sync packet. After that, uh, TPA expects a thin act packet as a reply. Of course, we can get the packet from Linux kernel, right? But somehow, just like I said, uh, Linux kernel will always reply something normal. And then I, I was thinking, well, if no one can or maybe reply, make a reply or reply something we need, how about uh, we forge someone? We forge, we forge one, and then we inject it to the TCP stack to simulate uh, receiving a packet from the NIC, from the remote end. And, and then we, 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 we feed the packet to, to the stack. Well, for the, for the stack, actually, it doesn't really know where the packet is from, so it will treat the packet as a normal packet. It will go through the TCP stack, and then will send an ACK packet out. And at that time, the connection is established. So as you can see, it's, it's not something similar to like uh, standard unit testing. It's more like a unit testing for a whole TCP stack. And it only takes the package as the input, just like the real world, well, we take the TCP packet right, from the remote end. Uh, and to show uh, 
the, the effective of the unit testing. And here is an example about out of order receive. As you can see, I here uh, forged 10 packages to <laughs> simulate different kinds of abnormal case. And some case actually will, you may never uh, will encounter with a real lens kernel TCP, right? And then as you can see, uh, there are quite many different uh, out of order packages. And there are even like duplicate packages. And there are even like a package that uh, completely covers all the previous seg uh, few a few segments and and some some segments that duplicate segments and 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 then I inject them to the TPS stack and and then I can do a lot of examinations something like since all 10 packages are out of order, so there should be like no buffer to read. You can see that, uh, well, I, I do a search here. And, and, and the, the, the later part is actually uh, depend, on, depend on the implementation. And in TPA, we simply use a uh, uh, linked list. So you can see that after the processing, uh, there should be only four out of, out of order packages. And I even do some detailed examination, something like, well, the first packet has a segment from, uh, the sequence from uh, 500 to, to 600, and, and the, the second one, the third one, the last one. So to make sure every single step is expected. And then I'm sure, I'm going to show the, the journey of TPA development. And actually, uh, the, the unit test speeds up the development greatly. And take the connect module as an example. Uh, firstly, I will implement the connect module, write the code, and then I write the cases and I make them pass with like uh, um, uh, normal and abnormal uh, inputs. And then I write an application. I let it to connect a real TCP server a Linux server, and then it works perfectly as expected. And for that kind of reason, I don't really need to debug it because I have already done the debug with unit testing and it's really, really more easier to debug, easier to debug with unit test because um, of the limited code and limited case. And I then followed the same way to implement other modules um, like in order receive, out of order receive transmission, fast retransmission, and time out retransmission, and close. And then I got a solid and also functional TCP stack, a minimal one. And later, uh, every time I find a new bug, um, I actually will. I, I will do the load course, of course, and then actually I will write the, a unit test case to reproduce that. If that is, if, if it is can be reproduced, it somehow means my root cause is, is right. And then I will go um, go with the patch to fix that. And if the unit is passed, it means the bug is surely be fixed. And, for, and then uh, we now have like more than 200 unit test cases. And uh, so, uh, that is really, really helpful because uh, every time you add like new more more tests, uh, you will make sure that new code will not breaking existing and uh, what that you will get like no regressions. And I'll talk about uh, debugability now. So well, it's also something that some people will ignore. Uh, in my opinion, well, if you have like good debugability, uh, you, if you have, if you don't have good debugability, it may take me like few days to fix one bug, and if you have good debugability, it may I may fix like a few bugs in one day. So you can see the huge difference. Uh, well, every time, well, it's quite clear or like obvious to us that. 
uh, TCP DOM is a great tool, and it well, is a tool like all used quite often when debugging networking uh, issues. Uh, but however, uh, TCP DOM is too heavy, and so we cannot always turn it on. So that results to that it's not really helpful to debug some like one-time bug, there's some bugs that cannot be uh, reproduced. So I was thinking something like something that can be always on, and then I came up with something called like a sock tracing. Uh, is it, it is filled in binary format, so it's lightweight, and it is a ring buffer, so it will not eat the disk uh, or memory. And here is some details about uh, the stock uh, tracing. As I said, it's a it's a ring of buffer, and actually it's a it's a ring of like uh, trace records. Every record is with fixed size, um, eight bytes. And here is an example of uh, tracing a received packet. As you can see, it has two records. Uh, the first record um, uh, trace the sequence number, the receive window, the TCP flags, and the second record uh, traces the act number, the length, and the number of segments because we do uh, merge at the input stage. And then we have a, a stand-on tool to to analysis the, and to jump the binary data to turn them to something like more readable. And you can see, and as you can see, we just you need to two records that is 16 bytes to trace uh, one received packet. And here is an example output to show the like helpful of the the mechanism. As you can see, uh, well, I, I run a, a Swim application, something I'm also going to show later. And um, well, it was firstly, as you can see, well, uh, the, uh, the first three line actually shows the three-way handshake. And here uh, you can see a TPA sent a thing, and here you can see uh, we received a, a thing act packet. And then we also send the ACK packet to terminate the uh, connection stage. And as a landmark four, you can see that uh, we uh, transmit something, and that is uh, with 12 bytes. And later, at this time, we got the response from uh, the remote server, and that is also 12 bytes. So it's really helpful. I mean, it gives you some like internal insights about what ha what was actually happening, and so that really helpful for debug purpose. Um, in addition to socket tracing, TPA also has uh, dozens of tools and uh, about like 100 counters. Uh, with the counter, you can uh, locate so is that line of code like something well, well is the issue. And we also have uh, more than 50 config options. Um, TPA is like a fully like customized uh, option, uh, TCP stack. And for the limited time, uh, you can find uh, more information from the TPA guide, user guide and document. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the program guide. Um, TPA for many for for performance um, purpose, we came up with um, customized uh, ap uh, APIs. Uh, it can be divided like loosely for four parts. That is like uh, for connection management, and for I/O the read and write, and for event handling, something like ePool, and then the last part is quite. Uh, TPA special. So these are the common APIs. It's somehow a bit small. Uh, well, as you can see, well, TPA provides simplified uh, applications 
we don't have to create a socket folds and then do the band, do the coordinate, something like that. Uh, but somehow, uh, you can invoke one API to start uh, the connection. And uh, the server is in, in, in type of char in string, but not like something like a socket uh, binary format. And uh, that is because, well, that is because uh, the first time I developed the TPA, there is no, t no IPv IPv6 support. But somehow I was thinking on the IPv6 support and to make sure to make the API compatibility, I, I make the inter uh, interface to accept uh, um, and the string. So it will work for IPv4 and IPv6 uh, without um, breaking the API. And, and that's quite similar to the listen and also well for the accept. As you can see, the accept is bound to one worker, one specific worker. And well, and, and for the IO uh, APIs, we have already shown that. And also here is a event handling that is also quite similar to the ePool except that we have no uh, like event create because in TPA, all the connections are bound to one worker only. So you just need to provide the worker and then it will return all the um, connections that have data to read or to write um, to you. And, and then that is a special part, uh, the worker management. Uh, TPA a worker is a core processing unit in, in TPA. And uh, so, and well, TPA is an uh, embedded TCP slide just as short. So you, and it lives together with uh, application code. So it's the application to call this API to trigger the, the running of a TPA. And, and for this API, it simply does three kind of things, and that is to Im receive packages from the NIC and go through the, go through the TCP stack, and also to get the send request from the application and go through uh, the TCP stack and then send them out, and also it handle, handles uh, timeout. And here is a programming example. Uh, as you can see, well, the big view is that there is a, a dead loop. It's a run to completion model. And, and so you need to keep invoking the TPA worker run to trigger the TCP processing. And then you can use this API to accept the new connections. And then you can like uh, register them and uh, that you can get like new events. Uh, it's quite similar uh, to ePool. Something like, well, you, you have an in, in event, then you can read the packet uh, with the zero copy read one. And you can see, well, uh, you can see when, when, when the data is read, you can post them. And when you have done the processing, you have to return the buffer to TPA by this core bike. And uh, that is somehow similar to the write, and you need to set up the, the write IOV segment. You need to fill uh, the physical drives, you need to fill the write down the, the core bike, and then you can you can trigger the, um, the write V API to do the send. And then you can run your code here as a, as a whole loop. And the, here um, uh, is a user guide. In, in TPA, you have two ways to run uh, TPA applications. The first one is using the config file, just like here. Uh, you, can, you can write the config file with uh, necessary information, the name, the IP, and also the TPDK PCI device. And then you can run the application like uh, typically, and, and and swing, and 
And the second one is uh, run with a TPA repo. That would be much simpler. It will do, uh, will, it will uh, detect the system and, and generate the correct uh, configs uh, automatically for you. Something like here, it can uh, set the name, the, the Ethernet device, the mic, the IP mask, and something, and uh, even um, config the IPv6 part. So it, sh it should be like more convenient. And um, besides, uh, we also have some like debug tools. And the first one is Swing. Uh, it's a telnet like tool, uh, mainly, mainly for verification, verifying everything is set up correctly. And there is another tool called Takeo that can be used together with Swing. And it basically echoes by what it receives. So also to make sure we have a function, functional uh, TCP server. And we also have a, a benchmark, uh, somehow quite similar to uh, NetPerf. Uh, it has quite many options, something like you can have, you can test different modes, something like a read write and a read write, and uh, what well, is a, a request and response is a ping pong, and, and CRI is just like a RI, well, except that, well, Every time there is a ping pong, we create a new connection, so it can be used to testing um, uh, short, short, uh, short, short uh, connections. And you can also specify the message size and the number of worker threads and uh, uh, the connections per thread, and it can even do some uh, simple uh, verification to make sure the data is sent correctly. And lastly, I'm going to show some very basic um, performance number. And the first one is a throughput uh, with one call. And uh, for the right throughput, well, with different uh, write size. As you can see, for, for 64 bytes, TPA can achieve a uh, seven gigabits Google boot, uh, which outputs uh, others by several times. And um, TPA can achieve 100 gig uh, gigabits long rate with uh, four kilobyte write size. And um, for the latency, we, we test with the RR test. Uh, with uh, 64 uh, request size and also 64 byte uh, re response size is one connection. Uh, and and there is a note that uh, the two, the two uh, machines are connected back to Pike without Tor. And you can see um, TPA has the lowest latency, something like ne uh, below six um, microseconds. And the last one is something like a real example, right? Real workload, and we test it with uh, Redis, and we test with uh, also com com compare with other uh, stacks. As you can see, the the throughput has been boosted nearly for like five six five times, and well, in the meantime, the latency. The latency is uh, also greatly uh, reduced. Uh, well, there is a disclaimer that uh, the Redis is uh, just for demo purpose. It's not uh, used in, in patterns. And, uh, and there is another number to show the trace um, uh, performance penalty. You can see with the trace on, which is default, and with the trace off, there is the difference is the it's not too much difference. Uh, basically, that's all. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Wunhan? Yeah. 
हेलो तो आई हैव यू क्वेश्चन बिफोर दैट आई लाइक टू क्लैरिफाई माय अंडरस्टैंडिंग सो एंड माय अंडरस्टैंडिंग दैट लिप टीपीए इज नॉट ए स्टैंड अलोन टीसीपीआईपी स्टैक और इज इट आई मीन इज इट ए लाइब्रेरी हु जस्ट अपलोड सम ऑफ द टीसीपी फ्लोस टू एक्सेलरेट देम और इट इज ए कंप्लीट टीसीपीआईपी स्टैक इज अ कंप्लीट स्टैक but somehow it's a special stack that it can come like come exist with the native stack but somehow it's a complete stack it has like uh well it has a very very uh, simple um like uh ethernet layer ip layer and but it has a complete tcp layer mm -hmm. all the logic here so it doesn't really depend on like it's not a fast pass for the kernel tcp it's a complete stack so any application who is including uh, this lib tpa do not require any other tcp ip stack implementation uh for the tcp stack yeah it, it doesn't depend on the kernel tcp stack but somehow it well it somehow depends on some other mechanism to uh, to implement especially uh, the arp and ndp and that is because we well ju just like you said uh we just received tcp package in tpa so we cannot receive um let me just wait a minute so uh here uh for for the tps stack it only can be able to receive tcp packages it cannot receive other type of package something like uh, uh arp icmp so well you, you know we need to arp and ndp to make it a functional tcp stack right so for that kind of reason we still need the kernel interface we, well we support the api so we actually we send the arp package in in the worker thread with the dpdk api and then the kernel so, so the remote send will receive the arp request right then it will make a reply and mm -hmm. then the reply actually will go to the kernel stack you will go here kernel stack and then it will be captured by the ARP module in TPA it actually will create a, like a socket, a proposing socket and then listening on some uh, ARP package. Okay, so, yeah. uh, one more question is that uh, you mentioned that there, uh, there is only attaching is required in case of when you are attaching to external buffer yeah. in case of zero copy, no detaching is required. Yeah and you free the buffer uh, by notifying the lib tpa right a, noti a notification or notification is sent when you yeah. need to free the buffer right so my point is that since lib tpa uh, is an embedded part of the application and should be running into the run, com run to completion mode th yeah. then how you are notifying it is it some callback or what because it is running in the application context there are no no two context where you are notifying from one thread to another yeah, thread. Yeah, so that is, here's the key. So uh, every time you want to do a zero copy write here, you need to use this struct. And with this structure, you need to fill the callback here. So when the data is act by the remote end, when we receive the TCP act segment, um, we will call this callback and that callback is a function from the application okay. and then we'll return the buffer to the application okay yeah. okay uh, one last question uh, you mentioned that latency has came down yet right? yeah to 15 microsecond i think what i remember on slide number 17 i think 17. this one uh 17 17 It was very near to the your baseline number. Yeah, let me. Yes, this one. one. Yes, yes. Okay. So your baseline is fifteen point three four yeah. microsecond. It, you have come nearby. But what about the jitter? Because I think the maximum is still uh, around ten thousand ten k microsecond, right? Yeah. So there is a lot of range from minimum to maximum. So there is a jitter is there. So how you are handling this? Because it is not giving a reliability for the sensitive application. Uh, are, yeah, well, are, that, uh, that is a good question. But actually, I, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to uh, the maximum, well, and the latency here. Uh, well, I think, well, I, I also didn't do uh, some, 
I think some techniques would help, something like CPU isolation and the common stuff, but I, I didn't really do that and because that is not my major. And I'm really more care about the like the average. Well, that is quite like obvious, right? To show the big difference. I think that is the point. And if you want to have like, uh, like have a, if, even for the maximum um, lat latency, you may have to do some tunings, something like uh, isolation, IRQ isolation, and something like that. So that that is something like out out of scope over here. Yeah, I got your point. Thank you. Hey, thank you uh, for sharing. Uh, two questions. One is on slide 12. 12? Yeah, one, two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here you mentioned packet steering engine, and yeah. I am, this is from the hardware NIC, where you segregate the traffic and all. Have you thought of using the XTB layer, XDP, Express uh, Data Path, yeah. for bifurcating ARP and yeah, neighbor actually, things. yeah, it's a good question. Actually, we also support that with SDP, well, well, XDP, and EBPF. But there are some limitations. Well, be many because SDP do not support, does not support uh, like TSO and something like that. So the performance is not really, really good. I agree, but for the ARP and neighbor discovery and all, you yeah, can segregate you can, it. Yeah, you can play with that, well, I mean, with XDP, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, good to know. Next is in slide 42 and 43, 42 and 43. Okay. Huh. So here in 42, you're mentioning we need TPA worker run that should be called in while loop. In 43, you're giving that example also. You have to continuously call TPA yeah. worker run. Yeah. Then only you will be able to receive and send traffic for that lib TPA to the hardware NIC. But uh, I, I'm not able to find with a congestion control algorithms are supported like Cubic or XTP or, or XTC and all. No. So w what all congestion control algorithms or window sizing algorithms are supported in lib TPA? Thank you. Well, the simple answer is that uh, TPA doesn't support any kind of QAs yet. Yeah, it's run to completion. It's just well, it's mainly for performance purpose. But somehow, I I actually spend a lot of like time and and like um, resource. Um, I mean, energy to to the debugability and the unit testing. Well, mainly for the quality and the like uh, further on call something like that to make my further life easier. Yeah. Do you have any plan to plug this into the node graph infrastructure? To what uh, architecture? Graph infrastructure. Graph stones. Gra lib graph. Graph DBTK. Yeah. I have no plans yet. I'm sorry to that. Okay. Any other questions? Or Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this great piece of software, and thank you for sharing your mindset. Very cool. Sure. Um, so, two questions: uh, What do you think about having TLS in libtpa? Well, in my opinion, TLS is just something like about TCP. So, in the point of view of TCP or TPA, it's just like another application or TPA, so in my it, opinion. Okay, so yeah. it could be another library maybe? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Okay, you don't plan to work on it? Uh, shortly, no. Okay, but you are welcome to, to see it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, uh, b because you know now we're, we start having some TLS acceleration in DPDK, so yeah, it could be nice to see. Uh, maybe it's related to the first question, but uh, did you try to um, integrate libtpa in applications like ngnx or others? Uh, yeah, well, I think that's a good question. And well, I think uh, engines is also like a good 
candidate to boost the performance with TBA. Um, I haven't done that. And for the purpose, well, I have done, we have done the uh, integration with the radius. Uh, so I think that is doable, but I haven't done yet. Okay, so for now, you use it only in a specific TCP application, which is not public, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we have some specific uh, scenarios in inside patterns. Okay, I think it would be a good idea to make a public call uh, to integrate it in known applications. Yeah, well, I, well, I, I, I even think about to like add the support to some event library, something like libEV mm -hmm. lab event, and that would be like more convenient for applications to integrate. Yeah. We can say it's already a big work, but there is more to yeah, come. Yeah, it's a big work. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Uh, do you also support blocking calls, like say pre uh, not yet. calls? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so the model of execution here, what I assume is run to completion. Yeah, it's one so it is about a TCP stack, then the application, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way where you have a stack and then a worker threads who can do things? Is, can that be supported? Sega? Can you also support a mode where the TCP stack receives a packet and then it handles over to worker threads, which can do some uh, special processing? It's a pipeline mode. Yes. Well, I, I was thinking something similar or maybe something a bit different is, that, well, I think it's, so the key here is, yeah. so here is the key. Well, you, you can use TPA to, I mean, to integrate TPA in directly to your application. That is one module is the one usage. And the another usage is that you can use a TPA to build a daemon process. And then mm -hmm. with the daemon process, you can provide service like TCP service to a lot of applications with something like you, uh, like shared memory. So... Yeah, I mean, something like a VPP model, you are saying? Maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do you plan to run any RFC compliance test suit? Out of what? Uh, RFC. Uh, there are uh, TC TCP IP RFC compliance test suit, right? Uh, no, no plan yet. Okay. So uh, what about bringing a socket layer so that NGNX kind of an application so you can simply run it? You need to do some modifications because we have like customized APIs. And well, I think the most challenging part to do integration is uh, is a run to completion module, because not all not all applications have this kind of module. Actually, it's like something maybe like may block TPA getting from more widely deployed because of the because of the running module. Uh, for that reason, just like I said, well, we may. Uh, use TBA to build some like daemon process and with the daemon process on, on like on top of the t and daemon process you can implement like, post API or something else or maybe even with like a lib event API and then the application has no longer need to like to modify to be not modified yeah. F stack oh, okay a good to know. Thank you. It, it makes me think to something else. You know, in DPDK, we have a public CI uh, which run in UNH mm -hmm. in America. Uh, UNH is a, has a lab called Interop Lab. This is where we run our CI. And in Interop Lab, I think it's maybe every year, they have some days where they check uh, many TCP stacks running uh, running with each other. You know, it's like a competition or something. Just to check that every TCP stacks are compatible with others. Maybe it's a good idea to discuss with them to integrate libtp and these checks. Okay, that's a good question. Oh, good suggestions, thank you. 
Hi, I was wondering what was the use case that uh, drove the requirement for running multiple instances of TCP stack? Like most NICs support SRLV and you can have like thousands of VFs and you can easily run any TCP stack attached to a particular VF. So why would you want like multiple instances of TCP stack connected to a single port? Well, uh, so, well, actually, uh, what is hard to say? Uh, it depends on your needs, it's more like that. So, uh, but at least it provides the possibility, right? And before that, you have no such possibility. So, basically, something like that. Okay, last question, maybe? Uh, I see the performance that you told that uh, you can achieve the 100G line What is the, the how many session do you use? TCP session, one session? Yeah, that is one session. And uh, you use uh, only uh, write, and how about the read? Well, actually, uh, so here's the thing. Uh, because of the TSO, and so the write performance is much better, right? Than than the rate because we have no such thing or while well, we have something like LRO but we do not enable that. And so well here, well I say it's a right performance, but somehow it's also the right performance right because it's a one connection. And for right actually it can be more than two hundred gigabits per core. But for rate, I think something like one hundred something like is is the kind of like is the base we can get. So actually here is showing something like, it's more like showing the rate performance here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Renhan. Okay. Maybe nobody knows, but Renhan was the first maintainers of stable DPDK branch. Yeah.